I'd now like to welcome our guest speaker, Sas Bale. Sas is the head of industrial logistics research in Australia at CBRE and leads the New South Wales research platform across all sectors. Sas is responsible for managing CBRE's industrial logistics platform and provides research and analytical input into internal business lines as well as clients of CBRE. SAS has experience in economic research and consulting across a range of property sectors, and she's specialised in several major industrial mixed-use residential rezoning projects and studies across the Sydney metropolitan area. Please welcome SAS. Thank you, Steve. The Australian industrial and logistics sector entered the COVID-19 pandemic with strong property fundamentals, including low national vacancy rate of sub 3% versus the global average of 7%, limited speculative development activity, relatively strong occupy demand, and growing capital appetite from a number of domestic and global offshore groups. These fundamentals will continue to drive the resilient performance of the sector. In particular, the global structural e-commerce tailwind is relatively immature in Australia and is expected to further fuel the trajectory of growth. Over the long term, the two most relevant economic variables for global real estate investors to benchmark Australia to other global economies are GDP and population growth. The outlook for these two variables are favourable for Australia. Population is one of the key drivers of demand for industrial and logistics space. And we have estimated that one person generates four and a half square metres of floor space. Looking at the population forecast therefore indicates that an additional one million square metres of space will be required per annum, which is around 80% of the new supply being delivered to the market each year. And this is just natural demand increase. The demand from e-commerce will be a significant additional factor of demand for industrial logistics space. In fact, we are already seeing e-commerce having a transformational effect over the past 18 months, which has been accelerated from the global COVID pandemic. Floor space take up from the retail trade sector for the first time last year was the major contributor to demand, making up 34% of take up followed by transport, postal and warehousing at 30% and manufacturing at 18%. Take up so far this year has been led by transport, postal and warehousing. However, retail trade still makes up a significant component at around 20%. The greatest space requirements from retail sector occupiers is in line with the growth of e-commerce spending, which has now reached $51 billion over the past 12 months. That's a record penetration rate of 14% of total retail spend, still below the global average of 22%, and so we forecast greater scope for further expansion in this sector. Specifically, our forecast e-commerce penetration rate is 20% by 2025, and that equates to an additional 460,000 square metres of industrial logistics space requirements per annum. Therefore, to cater for this growth in e-commerce, new supply will need to be elevated by 35%. This is a step change in occupied demand going forward and we are just on the onset of the e-commerce growth trajectory. A stable long-term driver of growth for the sector is the expansion of food manufacturing, food logistics and associated transport activity, which is also supporting the online grocery sector. The non-discretionary retail trade segment in Australia, which encompasses domestic food and beverage spending, has been experiencing long-term average annual growth of above 3%. These types of goods are relatively demand inelastic, and therefore changing economic conditions has little to no effect on consumer spend for these products, as they are essential. In fact, during the global pandemic in 2020, we saw the non-discretionary retail trade sector grow by a record 12% year on year. Occupy floor space take up in the food sector has been significant in recent years, led by major supermarket retailers. Also supporting the growth of Australia's food and beverage sector is global demand. Food and beverage exports make up 11% of Australia's total merchandise exports 
and this has the potential to increase given Australia's comparative advantage in food production, as well as being supported by Australia's 16 free trade agreements. Consumer staples also includes the pharmaceutical sector and that brings us to life sciences which is emerging in Australia and has huge growth potential for the industrial logistics sector with respect to occupier and investment activity. Global pharmaceutical companies are already expanding their production capabilities in Australia including research and development, manufacturing and distribution. Some of the significant factors making Australia an appealing destination include a healthcare system that's adaptive to innovation, a strong regulatory system protecting intellectual property, a well-resourced research sector with respect to a skilled workforce and quality medical research infrastructure, a number of government initiatives and programs providing businesses with tax offsets for research and development activity, and the fact that there are already well-established major life science precincts. Another major reason that makes Australia an appealing destination for life science activity is the current and forecasted growth in the share of health expenditure. Government health spending in Australia equates to around 10% of GDP. Compared to other major markets within the Asia-Pacific region, this is on the upper end. However, when compared to the OECD countries, Australia lags behind a few of the other major countries including US, Germany, Canada and France. Examining some of the major OECD countries provides a good indicator of Australia's direction of growth. This is due to the similarities they all share in terms of health systems and standards of living. Expenditure in the health care sector will continue to rise and will be the fastest growing areas of Australian government spending over the next 40 years, as highlighted in the recently published Intergenerational Report 2021. The report forecasts that Australia's health spending will increase from 19% of total government spend today to 26% in the next 40 years. This is underpinned by demographic factors, including population growth and an ageing population, as well as technology, con changing consumer preferences and rising incomes. Based on the federal government's forecast spend on the health sector and population forecasts, we project Australia's total health expenditure per capita to reach approximately US$7,000 by 2030, which is where Germany's level is at today. Australia's life science sector is relatively immature and there's historically been a dependency to rely on global multinationals to service domestic consumer demand in pharmaceutical and medical goods. This is reflected in the value of Australia's exports and imports in medicinal and pharmaceutical products. Although the value of exports has been on the rise over the past 30 years, the value of imports has risen at a faster rate. Over the past 12 months, Australia has exported $5 billion of medical and pharmaceutical goods versus importing $13 billion. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the sovereign risk associated with being over-dependent on offshore production and distribution and imports of medicinal and medical products. There is already a strong push from federal government and the Australian healthcare sector to create resilience and domestic capability with all things relating to pharmaceutical life sciences, including onshore manufacturing. This includes the Modern Manufacturing Strategy, Manufacturing Collaboration Scheme, which incentivizes international investors, businesses and researchers to work with Australian organisations on large-scale projects. Eligible projects receive funding for up to one third of project costs. There's also the Patent Box Scheme, the Medical Research Future Fund and R&D tax incentives. This is a direct investment injection in the critical goods industries. In doing so, the expansion of occupiers within this space will continue and perhaps even now accelerate growth. With the lockdown measures from the pandemic resulting in huge supply chain disruption and causing major logistical challenges for corporates and their 3PL contractors, there will be long run implications on how supply chains are structured to become more resilient and mitigate external risk. This implies the greater need for industrial logistics space in Australia. One of these I have mentioned is reshoring manufacturing on critical industries. But there is also a greater need for changing inventory strategies. 
Companies which have moved to very lean supply chains with low inventory cover may seek to increase inventory levels, therefore moving away from a just-in-time inventory strategy to a just-in-case one. Australia's retail inventory to sales ratio has been trending down over the past 30 years, reflecting a just-in-time and lean inventory model. And it really fell in 2020 during the pandemic lockdown period as demand soared and stock depleted. Replenishing of stock in certain retail sectors was inhibited by global supply chain disruptions. In the US, they have historically had a higher inventory sales ratio, with the lowest point at 1.34. And that downward trend started to reverse from 2012 when their e-commerce channel became more significant. The need for retailers to hold more stock in inventory to minimise fulfilment delays caused that inventory to sales ratio to increase from 1.34 in 2012 to 1.5 in 2019. And this is a trend we expect to see in Australia in the medium term. Rising inventory requirements will result in greater demand for space. So the outlook for the Australian industrial and logistics sector remains positive, and the sector in our view will continue to remain an attractive asset class for investors in the medium to long term. That brings me to the end of Australia's industrial and logistics sector outlook. Back to you, Steve.